welcome back to the class in the last class we discussed how the instantaneous magnetization the instantaneous energy varies as, as a function of uh, monte carlo step at a fixed temperature uh, as we change uh, different temperatures different box sizes and from that we realize that if we average over different microstates if we average m or e over different mi microstates and calculate the so called thermodynamic average of m or e then and, and if we do it naively then uh, we could get wrong numbers because especially at small box sizes m could fluctuate wildly from plus m to minus m and if you average it naively you will might uh, get a zero value of for average m whereas actually the system might be magnetized with this background that we discussed last class what we are going to do today is systematically look at calculation of uh, average m average e cv and chi versus temperature so here i have put in angular brackets and angular brackets essentially mean uh, it's an expectation value it's an average value average over different microstates that is the thermodynamic average when you have basically averaged the value of mi instantaneous magnetization and averaged the value over different microstates simply added it up and divided by the total number of microstates accessed then you get the so called thermodynamic value which is the quantity which you measure in the lab or which is the uh, quantity which you calculate using your statistical mechanics right now even as we plot these quantities versus temperature there are various questions uh, that immediately arise when you are doing simulations uh, of course we are going to calculate these quantities at different values of temperature and how closely should be very temperature so what should be the value of dt so like suppose 3.1 3 2.9 or should it be uh, smaller values of dt with 3 2.95 so what how how much should be the change in temperature how much should we wait before the system reaches equilibrium we already discussed about relaxation times in uh, the previous lecture especially i would ask you to note that at lower temperatures the relaxation time the time that a system takes to reach equilibrium at that particular temperature might increase so at low temperatures you typically have larger relaxation times right when we are plotting these quantities the various thermodynamic quantities should we take the heating curve or the cooling curve ideally if it's a system is perfectly in uh, equilibrium in as per equilibrium statistical mechanics we read in theory uh, they should be identical unless there is some hysteresis hysteresis is there in first order phase transitions this one we, that we are studying is second order phase transition so ideally there should be no hysteresis but often there are problems but are we getting identical curves during heating or cooling these are things to check before even you start to plot analyze your data or and start drawing conclusions we discuss this aspect later what difference would it make in the phase diagram uh, if we use average magnetization if we calculate the expectation value of magnetization or if we take the absolute value of m so that uh, both positive and negative values of uh, magnetic states basically have some finite value of m and then we average over that what difference would it make we already discussed we are going to use this uh, to calculate our phase diagram in the phase diagram on the y axis one shall have the thermodynamic value of the order parameter which in this case is the magnetization on the x axis there shall be temperature and shall plot in the phase diagram how does magnetization change as a function of temperature and at what value of temperature does the magnetization become zero basically we have the transition the phase transition from a low temperature ordered phase to a high temperature disordered phase where all the Uh, where the system essentially becomes in the paramagnetic state in the paramagnetic phase right how do we determine this temperature accurately does it depend upon the box size i mean the 
ideally it should not i mean i mean and typically in physics you are discussing about n equal to infinity n being the number of spins right so you have a fixed temperature but in simulations we are doing simulation with suppose a 20 cross 20 box or a 40 cross 40 box so which means you have 400 spins or if you have a 40 cross 40 box, you have 1600 spins. Does that give the thermodynamic limit? How do we get the thermodynamic limit, right? I mean, we, which should match with experiments. Is there some finance effects or not? Other question is, how do we decide at any particular temperature over how many Monte Carlo steps should we average so that we can claim that the expectation value of M is well averaged, right? So, these are the questions we shall be discussing, debating, trying to figure out even as we plot various thermodynamic quantities to identify the transition temperature and basically to see uh, and to see or to understand the phase transition, okay? So, with this background, let us basically move to the computer and start looking at graphs and data which we have generated, uh, which I have already generated for you using different runs where we where I save data at different temperatures, different box sizes, heating or cooling in different uh, files by changing the files uh, which is basically done here. So, as I change the conditions, as I change the box size, as I change the values of dt, um, I have been changing this uh, name of the file. This is the same code that we discussed last time, suitably uh, modified so that we can look at uh, averaged quantities uh, with temperature and uh, you have to give different names as you do different runs and plot them together to compare different cases, right? We shall do that. You shall see that. The other thing I insist on reminding you is when I plot the data, to compare across different box sizes, I shall be plotting magnetization, average magnetization and average energy per spin, right? And that will be calculated here, basically ABS, absolute value of M and sometimes I also remove this absolute va uh, value so that I can compare uh, the magnetization, the average magnetization when the absolute value is not taken, uh, right? So, here I have divided by d float n, n is the total number of spins. So, basically I have magnetization in this step, I am calculating the average magnetization per spin, right? And similarly, I am calculating the average energy per spin. But uh, when I want to calculate C v uh, or chi, the specific heat capacity or the susceptibility, I do not uh, divide it by n. I want the fluctuation, the E square minus E average square or M square average minus M average square of the entire system, okay? So, I do not divide it by n. I want to look at the fluctuations of the entire system, the heat capacity of the entire system, right? And that is what I will be plotting and here, I have not divided by d float n. Here I am calculating the average uh, magnetization of the entire box, different box sizes for different runs. Here I am calculating m square for the entire box, right? And here basically, so after this at each temperature after knitter iterations, uh, which I shall choose to be 1 lakh, okay. Then, uh, uh, so basically I shall choose knitter to be 1 lakh 10,000 because uh, at each temperature I am going to discard the first 10,000 Monte Carlo steps because I will allow it to equilibrate at the new temperature for 10,000 steps and then I shall uh, calculate the average value over the next 1 lakh or 10 to the power 5 iterations, right. So, here I have given an if statement, if time is greater than n equal, then only start collecting data for uh, thermodynamic averaging and after this loop is over, I am basically calculating the average value averaged over knitter minus n equal 
number of iterations right and then writing it down in a in a file where i'm writing down temperature average magnetization average energy uh, cv of the entire box the specific heat capacity of the entire box and the susceptibility so this there will be five columns and i shall be plotting it for different box sizes right so i have already done that and so just for the sake of uh, completeness i shall compile it uh, once again for you and now i shall run it the box size is 20 cross 20 and the number of iterations at each temperature okay is 1 lakh 10000 10000 iterations are uh, you are giving it to equilibrate and it's going to run for some time it's going to take around uh, um, a minute okay and uh, then but i have already done this and plotted uh, data so let's now look at the analysis of data so uh, what we see here is essentially the average magnetization and energy so this blue uh, data is the magnetization versus temperature the, on x axis i have uh, plotted temperature dt has been 0 0.1 the box size is uh, l equal to 20 and uh, what, I, uh, what I have plotted here is the average magnetization where I have not taken the absolute value and this green data is where I have averaged by taking the absolute value of m. So, whether the state of the system is positive or negative, so all spins pointing up, most spins pointing up or down. If you take the absolute in value of the instantaneous magnetization, Right? then you will always get a positive value independent of whether the value of instantaneous m is positive or negative and I have to do that because for especially for small box sizes you might end up getting a wrong value we discussed this last class if you have any confusions please look back at the last class and what we see here in the data is when you plot expectation value of m without uh, the taking the absolute value at higher temperatures you get zero value as expected because uh, sometimes the spins are positive sometimes the spins uh, the average ma instantaneous magnetization is negative and it's fluctuating about zero and you when you take a good average it should be zero but at a temperature of 2.1 it suddenly jumps to minus 1 which means there has been a transition here right but this shows up as a jump now knowing about ferromagnetic transitions we already know that this is a second order transition and the data should look more like this where it is gradually increasing from a zero value to a finite value and not a jump a jump is indicate uh, is indicative of a first order phase transition now in this case we already know that there is a problem because we know about the Ising model one can has analyzed it over many years but it is important that suppose you did not know whether a phase transition is first order and second order then how would we approach the problem right so we will discuss all these things so here it shows a jump but we know uh, that uh, this calculation is uh, not appropriate we would rather uh, use the absolute value of m to calculate it and that shows a gradual increase as it should but if you take this absolute value the artifact that you are introducing into the system is above the transition which is just below 2.3 i have drawn this dashed line just as a indication the transition should have happen it's already known that the transition should happen here actually slightly less than 2.3 i have drawn the line exactly at 2.3 so here the transition so at 2.3 the magnetization ideally should be zero but here we see a finite value moreover at even higher temperatures you don't get 
zero magnetization as you ideally should get as you get here, but here you are getting a finite value that is because even the fluctuation sometimes positive negative it is always taking the positive value. So, this is the error that you are introducing into the system here it is definitely showing a wrong a value that this is magnetized it shows that there is no magnetization here uh, whereas we know that the magnetization actually occurs at some such value at a value of around just below 2.3 as i said at some such value right so here it is showing a wrong value because of large scale fluctuations which happens near tc and even from here from this data for L equal to 20 we cannot exactly identify what is the transition temperature. The questions is should we look at the uh, data of C V and chi which is supposed to show a peak from there can we extract this value. The other question is should we plot this, this data with smaller values of dt so that you have more finer points between say even a change of dt equal to 0.1. Here this is the data for energy, energy per particle uh, it uh, basically at higher temperatures it has a value close to around minus 0.5, but as you lower the temperature. So, there is a change here and it gradually goes to some number close to minus 2. Uh, here I have changed, uh, taken the range of temperature to be 1.5 to 3. Of course, you can take your system down to lower temperature we will do it at a later point of time, but here we at the moment our focus is trying to identify the transition temperature. Okay. Now, we saw from the data of M and E that it is difficult to identify what is the transition temperature. So, in this plot I have plotted average uh, C V the E square average minus E average square by T square and chi M square average minus M average square by T K B is 1 and uh, basically the red curve shows chi the blue curve shows C V and I have plotted this versus temperature it is extremely important to always give access labels the, the figure should be easily seeable and readable just like I hope it is easy for you to see and uh, this is uh, for lattice size of 20 I have labeled it properly this is the way to uh, present data when you show it to anybody including in your exams anyway. But focusing on the data, we see that there is a peak in chi at around 2.4 and there is a peak in C V at 2.3. We also notice that it is possible that the transition could be somewhere here or here and definitely the value of d t might not be good enough. Maybe we should have smaller values of d t so that we can the, uh, look at identify the temperature at which the transition happens more accurately. This discreteness is not sufficient uh, for basically identifying the transition temperature because it could be anywhere in between these two values and moreover these two the peak the position of the peaks are not matching. Is there a dependence on L? What uh, if we plot the same quantities for different box sizes? Let us have a look. What I have done here is plotted C V okay, the specific heat capacity for different box sizes L equal to 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 right at each temperature to calculate each of these points basically uh, I have averaged over 10 to the power 5 iterations at each temperature and then I have varied uh, the temperature allowed the system to reach equilibrium at that temperature and then averaged uh, and calculated the average value of that of C V at that temperature and plotted them C V versus temperature. What do we see? We see that as we increase the box size the peak sharpens right. So, it be, so a smaller system has less fluctuations a larger system can allow 
for larger fluctuations to ha happen, right. Remember delta E by E goes as 1 by root n, but delta E or delta m the fluctuation in magnetization goes as root n. You should plot that and check whether that is uh, happens or not. So, the peak becomes sharper. So, uh, the other thing that you can notice is the position of the peaks seems to move slightly to the left as you increase box size. Right. So, here there is a peak, uh, it is not exactly clear. Um, so, here there are large fluctuations and you, you cannot exactly identify the peak, whereas for more smaller systems you have a relatively broad peak, uh, but the position of the peak definitely shifts a bit to the left wherever, wherever it be. So, this might be better than m uh, by plotting uh, m or e. Uh, versus n versus temperature, where it was getting very difficult to identify the transition here. At least there is a distinct peak, but the position of the peak uh, seems to change. So, this could be the transition temperature, but which transition temperature to choose? Moreover, we realize that uh, for smaller systems, averaging over 1 lakh iterations seems to be good enough, but clearly for L equal to 30, which is this data. Uh, the data becomes noisy, there is not a smooth curve as one should expect, right. It is not a smooth curve, even here you would see that there is a very broad peak, there are small fluctuations. So, what I have already done in the past noticing this is that I ran for L equal to 30 instead of averaging uh, getting the average value of C v by averaging over 10 to the power 5 iterations, I averaged over 5 into 10 to the power 5 iterations, 5 lakh iterations at each temperature and I also have that data here. Which is shown in this maroon uh, circles, filled circles and here you see a smooth data right a smooth curve you can clearly identify the peak right you do not have any problems identifying the peak S message. For smaller lattice sizes 10 to the power 5 iterations was enough to calculate good values of the average of C v, but uh, for larger systems you need to average better because the fluctuations are more you need to average over larger number of iterations. There is one more point. So, such uh, fluctuations in the value of C v you did not see that for the value of energy and magnetization right and uh, that part actually we have not even uh, compared E and M for different box sizes, but uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, the fluctuations in C v which is the basically the second moment in uh, calculation of E, it is like fluctuation in E, you will need larger number of iterations to average over compared to the number of iterations you need to calculate average values of E or M. Let us have a look at chi. So, here again uh, you see I have plotted chi versus temperature for different box sizes and uh, you see that there are uh, you see a clear peak the peak the, the sharpness of the peak increases with uh, different uh, box sizes this is data for L equal to uh, 30 and again you see that if you average over just 1 lakh iteration, this is rather scraggy, it, uh, it is not a smooth uh, or good quality data, not good averaging. On the other hand, if you if you average over 5 lakh iterations, 5 into 10 to the power 5 iterations, then you get a very smooth relatively much smoother curve and you can easily identify the position of the peak. But again you see that the position of the peak changes uh, from this point approximately if you look at if you magnify this data here, uh, you will see that the peak is somewhere around this point, it has moved here 
and then as you go up the position of the peak keeps on moving to the left. In this case you are uh, you face the problem that which temperature shall you use to identify the transition because the transition temperature itself seems to depend upon the box size. So, as I shall introduce a bit later one needs to calculate the so called Binder's cumulant to identify the transition and that is the actual transition temperature using Binder's cumulant we can find it out which we can compare with our experiment. But here we are again seeing finite size Latin, uh, artifacts right as you change the box size the nature of or the position of the peak changes which gives us which uh, makes us face the problem that how do we find out the correct transition temperature of the Ising model from the simulations. <laughs>